Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, launch of a new Lowy Institute paper by Andrew Lee, MP, Choosing Openness, Why Global Engagement is Best for Australia. I'd like to thank you all for coming, uh, and I'd like to thank the Griffith Asia Institute for hosting us today, uh, and I'd like to welcome the Director of the Griffith Asia Institute, Professor Caitlin Byrne, uh, who you'll be hearing from at the end of our presentation. Um, thank you, Caitlin, for having us. Uh, I'm Sam Rogerbean, I'm a Senior Fellow at the Lowy Institute, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to host this event and just uh, throw questions at Andrew. Uh, I want to stress, in a moment I'll introduce Andrew to you all and then fire some questions at him myself, but this evening, the next hour belongs to you. I want to leave plenty of time for your questions. There'll be roving microphones around, so please do think about what you'd like to ask Andrew. The Lowy Institute papers, which you've seen outside and some of you have purchased. These are our flagship publications at the Lowy Institute. Uh, we publish only two a year in conjunction with uh, Penguin. I'd like to just point out on the second page where you see a short description of the Lowy Institute at the bottom there, you'll also see a URL, which is for uh, the website that I'm very proud of as the founding editor uh, of the Lowy Institute's digital magazine, The Interpreter. And what we do with these Lowy Institute papers is, uh, uh, after they're published, we get a, a bunch of uh, experts together to debate the themes of the paper, and hopefully we get Andrew involved in that as well. Uh, I'll be making my contribution to that discussion, I hope, later uh, this week. Uh, so please, if you've got your copy of the book, do, do log on to the interpreter uh, via the URL here, and you can see commentary from various experts, uh, e economists, um, and others around around the country debating Andrew's paper. We're really pleased that Andrew has written this paper because it reflects the Institute's ambition to have more of our politicians writing on international policy issues. Of course, the Institute regularly hosts speeches by politicians from all sides. Uh, we also host them on The Interpreter. One thing we do less frequently is to get them to write longer research papers for us. Andrew's not the first to do this. Uh, in 2008, the late Liberal Party Senator Russell Trude, a Queensland Senator, I believe, uh, wrote a Lowy Institute paper on the emerging global order. That was one of our most downloaded papers. Andrew won't be the last politician to write uh, uh, long-form research for the Lowy Institute either. In coming months, we're going to publish an analysis paper by Liberal Party Senator Linda Reynolds on defence policy bipartisanship. So, ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Lee is superbly qualified to make this important contribution to the national debate. Andrew is the Shadow Assistant Treasurer in the Federal Parliament. He's the author of several books, including The Luck of Politics, The Economics of Just About Everything, and Battlers and Billionaires. He was a Professor of Economics at the Australian National University, and he holds a PhD from Harvard. I'm going to start, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps on a slightly unconventional note, but I feel it's, it's almost unavoidable in the current circumstances because what I want to mention is that Andrew is also very well known th through his academic career for producing uh, research on the effects of Australia's gun amnesty, uh, research that's been widely cited in, in the US gun control debate. And in light of the tragedy in Las Vegas, I want to ask Andrew briefly about that. I realise it's a little off topic, Andrew, and I promise Everyone, we're going to get to the main themes of the book in just a moment, but I want to start with that research. What conclusions did you draw about the effectiveness of gun control measures in Australia? And uh, well, what does that mean for the debate in the United States? Well, thanks very much, Sam. Uh, you know, we have a gentle sort of sense of rain in here. I don't know if there's something the audio folks would like us to do. Beautiful, beautiful. Ah. And then the rain stopped and it was beautiful Brisbane weather again. Um, Thank you, Sam. Thank you to Lowy and to the Griffith Asia Institute, to Caitlin for your wonderful hospitality here. Um, I, I also would be remiss not to mention that uh, I have in the audience uh, my Aunt Janet, my Uncle Keith. Uh, Keith having uh, engaged heavily with our region during his time in Papua New Guinea over his career. Uh, and to, of course, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight. Uh, the work, Sam, that Christine Neal and I did on the, uh, on the gun buyback uh, showed very strongly in Australia uh, the impact of the foresight, for, uh, foresighted decisions by John Howard and Tim Fisher uh, to 
not only uh, make it tougher to own guns in Australia, but also to buy back weapons, to buy back about a fifth of the Australian weapons stock. Prior to that, we'd had, on average, uh, one gun massacre a year for the decade prior. In the decade afterwards, we didn't have a single gun massacre. Uh, but, of course, most people who die of gun deaths uh, don't die in massacres. Uh, they die at the hands of a spouse, or even more commonly, themselves. And what's striking about the research that Christine and I did uh, was the finding that the gun buyback averted around 200 gun deaths a year, and that most of those were suicides. Uh, it was the 22 rifle sitting in the back of the closet that Dad hadn't used for ages, but that if it hadn't been handed back, could have been found by a depressed teenager and used to ta take his own life. Uh, so the United States, which is now at a stage of losing almost 100 of its citizens every day to gun deaths, uh, could certainly benefit from looking at the Australian experience, an experience which still allows sporting shooters to do their thing. Uh, when I go for a run in the morning, I go past the handgun club and the rifle range. And there's plenty of amateur sports shooters there. Uh, but we don't have the handguns tucked into the back of the belts by drunk teenagers out on a Saturday night. Uh, we don't have the handguns under the pillow and in the bedside tables. Uh, and that's what's costing so many American lives right now. It's, it's useful to remember, Andrew, and, and let me just segue gently into the main theme of the evening here that the, the gun amnesty and the gun control legislation that came about in Australia after the Port Arthur massacre, uh, Port Arthur massacre was passed in a matter of weeks. Mm. Uh, and yet political commentators in this country routinely complain that we just don't get anything done in Canberra anymore. There is, there is no more policy reform in Australia anymore. Are they overstating that problem? Well, it's interesting to, to look back on that period because it's not as though it was cost-free, particularly for the National Party, to uh, support that gun buyback. Uh, don't forget the Liberals got a min minority of the vote in the subsequent election, the 1998 election, and that saw an upsurge in the vote of Pauline Hanson, who picked up, I think it was 11 seats in the Queensland Parliament in a subsequent state election. When I've spoken to Tim Fisher about this, he attributes One Nation's rise in part to the Nationals' decision to support the gun buyback. Uh, but gee, what a far-sighted decision it was. And in some sense, it's akin, Sam, to the decisions that were made by previous governments on globalisation, uh, to make decisions that were in the long-term interest of Australia, to do your best to explain them, to realise that sometimes you won't bring everyone along with you, whether you're talking about a gun buyback or trade liberalisation, uh, but that ultimately in that true Burkean sense, politicians aren't elected simply to be ciphers for the electorate, they're elected to use their best endeavours to try and make decisions that are in the long-term national interest. So your book, the, the, the middle chapters of your book, Choosing Openness, talk about uh, three major features of uh, Australian uh, openness. One is free trade, uh, the other is open investment, and the third is open, uh, or, or at least a liberal immigration policy, a liberal and generous immigration policy. I think it's fair to say that on all three of those measures, Australia has been for the last generation or so one of the most open countries in the world. So why did you think it was important right now to make the case for openness? Uh, well, you can feel the cold winds of change about us. Uh, you can see in uh, the United States the rise of Pre President Trump, uh, certainly the most protectionist of the post-war presidents. Uh, the British Brexit decision uh, is uh, uh, evidently a hunkering down against uh, globalisation. Uh, I was just in Germany recently, where for the first time since the end of World War II, neo-Nazis have now entered the German parliament in alternative for Deutschland. Uh, in Hungary, the uh, far right is, uh, is, is ascendant, uh, and it also, you know, in France, you've had uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, in Denmark, in Austria, 
Uh, a host of other places have seen a rise in uh, far-right far politics. Uh, one analysis by Barclays looks across a couple of dozen developed countries and looks at what's happened to mainstream parties uh, and finds that mainstream parties have shed 12% of their vote in recent decades. And it looks too at people who are members of political parties and estimates that political party membership in advanced countries has halved. Uh, by the way, I should thank the Labor Party members who've taken the time to come out tonight. <laughs> uh, we've seen uh, a range of traditional institutions uh, decline in popular support. Uh, big business, churches, trade unions, and alongside those, major political parties. Uh, and the thing that major political parties have done quite successfully in the post-war era is to campaign for uh, policies of openness. But now we've got a downturn in trade as a share of GDP, a downturn in investment as a share of GDP, a downturn in permanent migration to OECD countries. And there is some prospect that perhaps we reached peak globalisation in 2007 and we're now starting to retreat from it. And that for Australia, which is, as you say, so traditionally benefited from globalisation, uh, would be a dangerous thing. Almost, uh, almost every economist would agree, uh, I think, with, with the basic idea of free trade. There would be uh, a great many to, I'd, I would say, a comfortable majority who would also side with you broadly on questions about foreign investment and on uh, a, a liberal and generous immigration uh, policy as well. And yet, you list a number of reasons in, that, in this book why those arguments, even though they're, I think, pretty strongly and in some cases even overwhelmingly held by economists and by the policy elite, they really haven't uh, struck a chord with the Australian public and even beyond Australia. There, there is still widespread scepticism about that openness agenda. Mm. Can you talk about why that is? Uh, you're totally right to say that most economists would support free trade. Indeed, you can almost think of it as a, uh, a badge of entry into the profession. But I'm not sure most lawyers would. And last time I checked, the test scores for getting into law were higher than the test scores for getting into economics. So it's not as though uh, the case for free trade is, is intuitively obvious. Um, the late great economist Paul Samuelson said comparative advantage is the best example in the social sciences of a thing that's both true and not trivial. Uh, and by that he meant that uh, trade is another form of specialisation. Uh, if you don't cut your own hair and fix your own car and make your own clothes, then you benefit from specialisation in the labour market, from focusing on what you do best and trading with others in the labour market to get what you want. And so too Australia, constituting just 0.3% of the world's population, can benefit in trading with the rest of the world. Focusing on the things we do best, high quality agriculture, education and tourism, advanced manufacturing, and then trading with the rest of the world to get cheaper TVs, uh, affordable kids' clothing, uh, high quality food that other countries make and that we don't. Uh, and the, the gains from trade internationally are akin to the gains from trade domestically in our labour market. And yet, of course, the, the, the kind of openness agenda that you advocate for in this book also has losers. Uh, they tend to be... Uh, it tends to be the case that overall uh, the nation and the economy benefits. Mm. Uh, but there are losers that, that tend to be in small concentrated pockets. Who, who are those people and how do you address uh, those who come out behind from the process of openness? Well, in the case of trade, they're people who work in trade-exposed industries. And I, I talk in the opening of the book about uh, uh, a guy who I met in a high unemployment suburb of Geelong uh, who works in a glass manufacturing plant associated with the auto industry. Uh, competition from uh, uh, the other countries' auto industries has made life pretty tough for auto workers in Australia, and we're seeing this week more of the shuttering up of that industry. 
Uh, we see too in migration potential threats for those uh, who work in quite similar jobs to migrants. It's one of the reasons our point system, I think, has generated much stronger popular support for migration here than, for example, you see in the United States. Uh, in the US, uh, so much more migration is low-skill migrants coming in, for example, to sectors like uh, food preparation, uh, childcare, gardening, and driving down wages in those sectors. In Australia, Sam, as you know, we've, we've taken a lot of migrant doctors. In fact, more than half the doctors in Australia now are migrant doctors. And that's probably acted to put a bit of downward pressure on the wages of doctors. Um, but for those who consume the services of doctors, that's uh, meant that uh, we're getting home visits now, something that was almost unthinkable a generation ago. Uh, so you have to manage those impacts. Uh, you need the strong social safety net, the redistributive institutions. Now, I'm a globaliser because I think it raises aggregate living standards. But because I'm in favour of openness, I'm also in favour of the social institutions to share the gains. Uh, but have those institutions kept up? Because, of course, the, 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 big, uh, the big argument against... Mm. Uh, the big argument about the failure of, of economic policy over the last, let's say, 10 years at least, but maybe more, is the increasing... this huge disparity in wealth in, in advanced economies in Australia, more so in the United States. Absolutely. And the trends in the United States are frankly terrifying. Uh, a kid born in 1940 had a 9 out of 10 chance of earning more than their parents over their lifetimes. A kid born in 1980 has only a 50-50 shot of earning more than their parents. Uh, one of the rules about mortality around the world is that it's always falling. And every time you measure the numbers, you ask how much more has mortality fallen since last time we measured it? Except for low educated white Americans where we've actually seen an uptick in mortality in recent years, due largely to opioid overdoses, alcoholism and suicide. Uh, in the United States, a study by David Order looks at uh, districts which are heavily exposed to trade with China and finds that they tended to vote for extremists, uh, far-left Democrats, Tea Party Republicans, and not for moderates. That country has uniquely poor social institutions to deal with globalisation. But our social safety net has always been very well targeted uh, and while I think we could do more with our education system, both at the secondary and tertiary levels, uh, we have managed uh, more effectively than most countries uh, to redistribute the, ga the gains of globalisation. But inequality and globalisation are intertwined and uh, people who don't take inequality seriously, shouldn't be surprised when there's a populist backlash against globalisation. Um, you, you've hinted there at some of the themes of the final chapter of the book, which is all about the kind of policy mm. uh, solutions you're proposing. Uh, and I want to get back to that in a moment. But first, I want to ask you about uh, the importance that you place in this book on, on having articulate political leaders that can make the case for the kind of uh, openness agenda you're advocating. Who are the examples you look to around the world with that agenda in mind? Well, I think the uh, modern day Paul Keatings are folks like Emmanuel Macron, Justin Trudeau, Angela Merkel, uh, who have, between them, managed to make centrist globalisation pretty sexy uh, and shown that it's not just the right-wing populace that can galvanise people to a cause. Uh, Justin Trudeau's uh, engagement with migration, for example, has been deftly done, uh, given that he's managing his relationship with uh, what Canadians call their big brother, uh, but at the same time is standing up for an open uh, Canada, which is defined by values, and not by stereotypes and ethnicities. Uh, Macron has been a strong voice for the European Union at a time where Brexit has uh, led some to, to question the, uh, the strength of that alliance. Uh, so we don't need to be scared of the populists. And we don't need to be scared of explaining globalisation, uh, recognising that this stuff is not necessarily intuitive. 
Uh, look, for 99% of human history, we lived in groups of about 150, uh, only a little more than the number of people in this room. Uh, and Robin Dunbar, the anthropologist, said that there's a reason all of these tribal societies converged on 150, and that's because it's about the number of interpersonal relationships we can hold in our head. Sure, you can remember more than 150 names, but if I need to keep in mind how Janet knows Keith, knows Jean, knows Caitlin, then 150 is about the limit of my brain. So these tribal societies converge on 150, and that's where we are for 99% of human history. We all look alike in those tribal societies. We all know one another's name. We all intermarry. And if we see someone who's different, then we should probably run away or fight them. That's how our ancestors managed to survive and pass their genes down to us. Great strategy for tribal societies, pretty terrible society for living in a diverse city like Brisbane. Uh, so the populists are, asking, are appealing to our primitive sense of tribal identity with groups of 150. Uh, and the globalizers need to take us beyond that with an appeal to universal values, with a recognition that uh, much of what can be great and beautiful in this world comes from engaging with people who are substantively different from ourselves. You began that answer by talking about uh, the modern, a modern day Paul Keating was the phrase you used. Um, that th there's a certain mythology that's built up in Australian politics, I would say on both sides of Australian politics, about that era, that it was an era, a sort of heroic era of policy reform. Um, let me ask you, what, what are the big heroic reforms? Let, let's just, let's stick to three. What are the three heroic policy reforms that are on the agenda today, do you think, that, that need to be, uh, the, the need, that the parliament needs to make in order to uh, take Australia into the future as an open society and an open economy? So climate change, I think, has to be top of the list. We had this position but over a decade ago, where both sides of Australian politics said climate change is happening, humans are causing it, and a market-based approach should be the cheapest way of dealing with it. That wasn't a right-wing or a left-wing position. After all, George Bush Senior had been the one who first used emissions trading in order to deal with the problem of acid rain. But that got broken, and we need to get back to that simple consensus in Australian politics. Now, I thought it would happen when Malcolm Turnbull took the top job. It's been a bit slow. Uh, but my hope is we can get to a stage where the advanced country with the highest per capita emissions in the world starts to actually bring its emissions down. Now, right now we're on track to have 2020 emissions exceeding 2,000 emissions, uh, and in which we do it using market-based mechanisms obviously. Secondly, engagement with Asia. Uh, the Asia story will either be a story of threats or opportunities. I'm happy to tell both, but I think we need to focus on the upsides of engaging with Asia. Where will the jobs of the future come from? Well, they'll come from plugging into the services supply chains of Asia. And there's so much to be excited by in Asia's rise. And, and I know the Griffith Asia Society is, is talking about all kinds of aspects of the texture of that. And Caitlin was speaking before about uh, work that uh, Griff uh, Griff Griff Griffith uh, uh, is doing on uh, ASE uh, arts in ASEAN countries. Um, that's got economic implications, but also social implications. Uh, and understanding better the culture of our region is, is one of the exciting uh, things of the future. Uh, and I suppose the third thing would be making sure that people can buy homes. Uh, it's one of the chief topics of conversation that you hear in, in pretty much any big city in Australia right now. Uh, my kids won't be able to afford a house. Uh, we, it oughtn't be beyond our wit uh, to fix up the tax system, to get the zoning right, so that we've actually got a, a system in place in which kids can buy a house. Uh, and that will contribute to social mobility, to intergenerational equality, uh, and to, to a sense of uh, uh, Australians being able to buy into something that's always been regarded as part of the Aussie dream. 
This will be my last question before I throw it open to people. I want to follow up on that, that, that second theme about Asian engagement. The, the, your, uh, what you said there is by no means new and policy, uh, policy experts and political leaders from across the spectrum have been saying that for you know, a generation or more. And yet uh, the economic relationship with Indonesia, for instance, our closest main neighbour, um, big neighbour, remains stubbornly undercooked. In fact, as I understand it, it's still uh, about the same or perhaps even smaller than our economic relationship with New Zealand. Um, what, what needs to change? So much of this is uh, contained in Chris Bowen's uh, speech uh, last Friday, launching our Future Asia policy. Uh, he uh, spoke there about the importance of boosting Asian uh, languages in Australian schools. Um, when I lived in Indonesia in the 1970s, there were more Aussie kids studying Bahasa in Australian schools than there are today. Uh, and even uh, with the, the rise of China, we still have terrifyingly few students uh, studying Mandarin. Uh, we need to get more Asia literacy uh, in our boards and, and we've announced we'll work with the Institute of Company Directors to try and uh, uh, make, make that happen better. Uh, and within the parliament, we've got a number of people who are now strongly committed to, uh, to personal engagement with Asia. Uh, Stephen Jones, Chris Bowen learning Bahasa, Matt Thistlethwaite learning uh, uh, Mandarin. Uh, and this week, uh, sorry, sorry, last week we had uh, Penny Wong and Bill Shorten travelling for high-level le high meetings uh, in Korea and Japan. Uh, more of that interpersonal dialogue really matters. Um, but it's also, we benefit greatly uh, from institutions uh, like uh, Griffith Asia and Lowy uh, in under, better understanding the issues as, uh, as parliamentarians, particularly from an opposition standpoint where we don't have the uh, terrific wisdom of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to fall back on. Uh, the quality of the public conversation uh, and the access, the quality of the briefings we can get access to, your Lowy interpreter blog, Sam, uh, all of this really matters for sharpening up the, uh, the Asia literacy of our, our politicians. I can't resist one further follow-up. Sure. Because you, you, you talk about uh, the importance of Asian languages, for instance. Again, not a new theme. It's been said by a lot of, a lot of people for a long time. And yet it, it can't be said, uh, or at least it can't be easily proved, that Australia has suffered for its appalling lack of Asia literacy. The, we're in our 26th year of economic growth. We're doing okay. Uh, we have perhaps reason to be a little complacent on that front. Uh, and I do get the sense that there is, uh, perhaps particularly in the business community, a slight sense of complacency. And that's partly because things are so easy in Australia. For big business in particular, a lot of cosy duopolies and uh, you know, in, 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 we have four banks, we have, um, you know, two supermarkets, the list goes on. I know you've spoken about this. So is, is life just too comfortable here in Australia for business to bother uh, projecting itself to in investing in the region? Well, you're certainly right that uh, our banks, for example, have been uh, shrinking their offshore footprint rather than expanding it. Uh, and that there, I believe, are, are plenty of interesting opportunities in our region for our businesses to export. Uh, exporting businesses do more research and development, they pay higher wages, uh, they're more likely to be growth businesses. Uh, and the export, diversified export market is also a way of uh, uh, sh um, shielding yourself against global downturns. Uh, one of the things that's happened when we had the Asian financial crisis or the tech wreck or the global financial crisis is that we've benefited from having a web of trading networks. Uh, and indeed, if you, see, if you were to see uh, a fall off in Australian domestic demand, uh, then one of the best things you can do as a firm is to have uh, exports into other markets in order to, to keep your business going through tough times. So it's a bit like an insurance policy, I guess, Sam. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it may be that you can get away in good times just by relying on a costed monopoly in a single market of 25 million people. But how much better could your business be if it was uh, engaging with a market of billions? Mm. Now we have two roving microphones. Um, if you would mind please just briefly identifying yourself, um, give us a, uh, a question rather than a, uh, a statement or a speech, but we have 
A gentleman here in the centre. Excellent. Migrating microphones. Remote. Thank you. Uh, my name's Gene Tunney. I'm an economist over uh, business adept economics. So Andrew and I uh, were in the Treasury at the same time in 2008 09. I think you were there for six months or so. So, um, Andrew, I'd just like to ask uh, I mean, you mentioned there were three areas of reform. What about labour market reform? Uh, for a long time, that was considered the great uh, unfinished uh, piece of reform in Australia. Is that still relevant? What are your views? Well, Jane, thanks for uh, reminding the audience that uh, my time as an economic policy maker in Treasury uh, coincides with the worst performance for the Australian economy over the last quarter century. Um, hopefully correlation is not causation, but if it is, then it's uh, certainly a black mark against me. Uh, we've had uh, the slowest wage growth uh, on record, as you, uh, as, you, as you well know. So this uh, uh, talk of a wages breakout is, is, I think, probably the least, uh, least of concerns for Australian businesses. Uh, for mine, the, the challenges are about making sure that we get uh, rising productivity, uh, which, as you well know, is, uh, is, is central to Australian living standards. Uh, I, that's, that's partly about the quality of management, uh, it's partly about the quality of our infrastructure and uh, when you talk to businesses that uh, engage on the internet they say that the more time they're spending buffering the less time they're spending making money. Uh, the problems that we've got with uh, congestion in Australia I think are uh, a drag on productivity and hence a, a drag on long run wage growth. Um, and Grattan has a, a useful report out with some interesting ideas on, ta on tackling uh, the challenge of congestion. Um, but for me, it's, it's not about reducing penalty rates or reducing minimum wages. Uh, I see precious little evidence that that's going to, to spur growth. Uh, instead, it's about making sure that our labour market institutions are, are fit for purpose for a uh, changing, uh, changing environment. Uh, and that might involve, for example, thinking about the way in which employment contracts are structured in the app age. Uh, in a world of Uber and Airbnb and Airtasker, perhaps this old dichotomy between employees and contractors needs to be replaced by at least a trichotomy in which there's uh, a different kind of contract that can be offered. Um, so that's the sort of labour market reform that I'd favour, uh, probably quite different from the labour market agenda of, uh, for example, uh, Erica Betts. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. My name's James O'Neill. I'm a barrister here in Brisbane. Uh, the greatest infrastructure project in the world today is one variously described as the Belt and Road Initiative, One Belt, One Road, mm -hmm. New Silk Roads. When the Premier of China was in Australia recently, he invited Australia to join in the BRI, which we declined. Would you agree that was a mistake? Yes, James, I would. And uh, Chris said in his speech that there's opportunities for us to engage with Belt and Road. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, if it's, uh, it comes to fruition, will see expenditure in excess of that put in place by the United States under the Marshall Plan at the end of World War II. Uh, and Australia ought to welcome infrastructure investment of high quality in our region uh, because it will raise the living standards of people we care about uh, and raise the living standards of Australians through the flow through impacts of trade. Uh, we've, um, for example, talked about the Northern Australian Infrastructure Fund uh, and the possibilities for that to dovetail in with Belt and Road. Uh, if Azerbaijan was, pro was uh, promising to put in place additional infrastructure investment of high quality, then Australia should welcome it and look to dovetail with it. Uh, and the same principle ought to apply to Chinese infrastructure investment. Uh, we, uh, the, the infrastructure investment has the potential to, to raise living standards. Uh, we should criticise it of its low quality, pork barrelling, looking after the elite. We should welcome it uh, if it's encouraging businesses and raising living standards. Now, Andrew, having hosted a few of these events over the years, I know from experience that the hands that shoot up are invariably male. So I just want to stress to the women in our audience that you will be called on if your hand goes up. And I think I see this lady. 
Yes, thank you. Hello, my name's Cynthia Dodd. I'm a languages education consultant. I got that on? Yeah. Uh, and I'm interested in a couple of the comments. Andrew, I was keen to hear that your, some of your colleagues are learning an Asian language. That's great. As a Japanese, retired Japanese teacher and a researcher into the development of intercultural capability um, amongst our youth, uh, I'm really keen to hear that. Um, I was shattered to hear um, uh, Adam Spencer last night on the ABC panel about um, drones and I can't think what else. Oh, about um, all children learning um, programming, you know, how to program computers. I hate to hear Adam Spencer say, well, all other languages are just useless. I thought, mate, you are missing the point. <laughs> the point is that we need to actually engage. And one of the issues that you were saying was about our business leaders not engaging. Can I suggest that a lot of that is to do with they don't know what they don't know. A lot of them have come through an era where it was not compulsory for Australian students to do a language, to study a language through senior years, into the senior years. Um, and a lot of them probably have come through some pretty bad language teaching, I'll admit that. But the point is that we are missing out, and there's much evidence to show this. Um, uh, there's an Asia business group based in Melbourne that, that can show you a lot of evidence about what we've missed out on because we've been arrogant, because we haven't spoken the language of Indonesia, of China, of Japan, of Korea, and we're missing out. So there is no room for complacency on that front. Um, it's an urgent need that we build into cultural capability, not just know how to program computers. Thank well, Cynthia, thank you for, uh, for the question and uh, also gives me a chance to acknowledge uh, Kiyoko Yanai, the uh, uh, Consul General of Japan, who's uh, joined us here tonight. Uh, and your point goes to the fact that language isn't just another medium of communication and that even if uh, Google's work on the Babel fish works as speedily as they would like, uh, there's still aspects of learning a language uh, that open your mind to the other culture. Uh, I do a podcast called The Good Life on living a happy, healthy and ethical life. And I interviewed Robert Desai uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, Robert collects languages like other people collect coins or stamps. Uh, he sort of eerily talked about uh, his first love of Russian and then of course German and French and Hebrew and now he's learning Indonesian. Uh, and he's also invented his own language called K. Uh, and he spoke there about uh, the way in which the languages uh, open up your mind to different perspectives and how if you really want to understand Russian literature, uh, you, you understand the framework uh, through learning the, learning the language uh, and gave the example of uh, how in Russian uh, it isn't uh, just the verbs that, ch that change according to the noun, but the adjectives that change as well. Um, so green might be a different word if it's applied to a person than if it's applied to a tree. Uh, and that gives you a, a framework into thinking, thinking about Russia, as indeed uh, learning the various formalities of the Japanese language does uh, to helping understand the way in which Japanese, the formality of Japanese business engagement operates. Um, I, uh, I'm forgetting my bahasa as fast as my colleagues are learning it, uh, but I know attending uh, an Indonesian language school in Bandar Aceh as a little kid uh, was an experience for me that was uh, uniquely eye-opening and which I never would have gotten without the language. Um, we have... Uh, no, yes, thank you. And then I'll come to you right after. <laughs> what a polite audience. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Shay. I'm a designer and I work in an innovation lab with things like drones, artificial intelligence, those sorts of things. I'm interested to know uh, what does it mean for us from an economic perspective when digital technology is actually quite global already, but yet we have challenges with how we get, um, gather tax revenue and uh, what that means for employment across borders. 
Uh, I'd like to know your perspective on that from an economic point of view. Mm. Great question. Well, Shay, it's a, a great and topical question uh, because I think one of the challenges to uh, public support for foreign investment is the sense that uh, big overseas companies aren't paying their fair share of tax. Uh, tax Commissioner Chris Jordan made an interesting observation after some of the public hearings that had taken place recently where he said that uh, various of the firms had come forward and talked about the value of their marketing activities. Uh, the, the companies that were exporting uh, uh, iron ore from Australia had said that uh, they marketed it through an offshore hub and because marketing was a very valuable activity uh, that, that offshore hub booked a lot of revenue. And then the tech companies came in and they said, well, what they do in Australia is essentially just marketing. And marketing is a very low value activity. So naturally, you wouldn't expect them to have very much revenue in Australia, nor to be paying very much tax. Uh, and Chris Jordan said, it's, it's just hard to imagine that the marketing of iron ore is a more valuable activity than the marketing of Facebook and Google. Uh, so we need to get those settings right. The OECD is doing some work on it. There's various kind of long-term and short-term reforms. But the simple fact of it is that unless we sort out that tax fairness piece, we imperil the public support for foreign investment. And for Australia, that's incredibly dangerous, Shay, because we, we rely one dollar in nine of Australian investment is foreign investment. Uh, we're enormously reliant on foreign investment uh, right, across, right across the economy. Uh, and the hit to wages and jobs, if we turn off the foreign investment tap, will be, will be substantial. Uh, but just like globalisation needs social institutions to share the benefits, so too foreign investment uh, needs tax fairness to sustain public support for it. Peter Layton, let me reward your politeness. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam. Hi, P Peter Layton from the uh, the uh, Griffith Asia Institute. I I think you know the argument for uh, globalisation just has to look back at at, uh, the, at the decline in Australian living standards, if you like, or the change in Australian living standards between the end of the first age of globalisation with the start of the First World War, and then the second age of globalisation starting up after World War Two. Mm. We can argue about how long after World War Two, but but that. That period was a was a bleak period for, for Australians and for the Australian e, e, e economy. But that reminds us that globalisation is not just our choice. It depends upon the choice others make as well, whether they wish to join us in in, in globalisation. Um, so, the, so my question is is two part, I suppose. Should we should we be hedging against globalisation retreating? And you've implied that globalisation is in retreat already implied, not stated. Mm. Um, and the second one is, if, if we should hedge against a possible retreat of globalisation, what, sh what should we be doing? It's a really interesting question, mm. Peter. So the, the notion is, if the world is to become more protectionist and, and we can't shape that protectionism, what does Australia look like? Uh, I, to some extent, the answer is, uh, is similar to a globalised world. You'd want to improve the quality of your education system and you would still be worried about the fact that when we've done the international PISA tests on every subject, every time we're tested for the last decade, we've gone backwards. So our reading and our maths and our science scores are worse than they were at the turn of the century. You'd still be worried about that in a closed economy as you would in an open economy. You'd still be concerned about inequality for fairness terms, even if it wasn't uh, to forestall a populist backlash. Um, but perhaps you'd also then be looking to uh, build more self-sufficiency, the case for food security, for oil reserves, for domestic manufacture manufacturing industries that could compete with, uh, with overseas goods uh, would, be, would be strengthened. But there's also another approach which says that you know, we're in the G20. We're not a tiddlywink economy. Uh, as uh, Ross Garner rather inelegantly put it at the press club, we're not a pissant country. Uh, we have the ability to shape world affairs and indeed to shape the pattern of globalisation. So in the 1980s, as we see the prospect of a world trade round coming to fruition, we set up the Cairns Group of Agricultural Free Trading Nations and use that to help bring the Uruguay round of GATT talks to a successful conclusion. Uh, we're involved in setting up the APEC leaders meetings 
which institutionalized for the first time a framework for the American and Chinese leaders, among others, to come, to, to come together. Uh, we're critical at the time of the global financial crisis in saying, you know, this G7, G8 thing, wouldn't it be good if we gave that a miss and went for a G20 instead? And the G20's preeminence is in a large extent because of Australia. And we get a seat on the UN, UN Security Council. Uh, so we've done a lot in order to shape globalisation and I'd like to see more of that active middle power diplomacy uh, in making sure that the world does take the openness path rather than the hunkering down like a turtle path. Also, Andrew, isn't it the, wouldn't classical economics tell us that the benefits of globalisation would accrue to us anyway, even if the rest of the world reversed its globalisation? Well, Sam, I, I guess this is put best by the great Cambridge economist Joan Robinson, who says that you should take rocks out of your own harbours, even if your trading partners don't take rocks out of their harbours. Uh, and indeed, when Whitlam and Hawke and Keating and Howard cut tariffs, they're actually not doing it uh, because they think they'll get something from someone else. They're doing it because they think it's inherently valuable to Australia to take rocks out of harbours. Uh, so, yes, there's, there's benefits in unilateral trade liberalisation, but there's even bigger benefits if we can persuade other countries to take the openness path too. Hmm. We've got a bit more time, so oh, we have someone questions. at the back there. Hi, I'm Jan Islam from Griffith Asia Institute. I just wanted to go back to a point that you made about the, uh, the fall in membership of traditional parties both left and right in, uh, in Europe and elsewhere. I, I understand that uh, the British Labour Party has bucked the trend under Jeremy Corbyn. I wonder whether you'd like to reflect on that. Thank you. So, Jan, it, as, a, as an Indonesian scholar, I've got to say that was not the question I was expect, expecting you to ask, <laughs> which is uh, it's, it's always terrific to, uh, to, to buck people's expectations. Uh, uh, British Labour is, I think, risking going down more of a closed economy path. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's been uh, a strong critic of the European Union, uh, opposed Britain's entry into, into the EU, uh, campaigned fairly tepidly against the Brexit vote, uh, and is, in my view, uh, hasn't been making strongly enough the case for Britain's engagement uh, with the world. Uh, what I worry about is that the uh, system in Britain which allows people to join the party for a very low cost but provides them significant say in how the party is run uh, ends you up with a leader who's potentially uh, unable to appeal to the median voter. Uh, yes, Corbyn is looking good given where the May government is at the moment, um, but I worry that with uh, uh, once the Tories decide who's going to lead them to the next election, uh, that Corbyn will will struggle to, uh, to 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 be competitive in that environment. Uh, I have many friends in British Labor. I hope I'm wrong about that, uh, but I do think with any community organisation, you always want to think to yourself: uh, Are we low cost, um, low engagement, or high cost, high engagement. Um, but I don't think you can cross the streams. Hmm. Please. Hi, I'm Leah Cragnellini, a law student. You referred to immigrants, but you haven't really marked on refugees. I was just wondering if the portrayal and treatment of refugees, not only in Australia, but in the UK, has contributed to the retreat and globalisation, mm. and if we change that, would that help our global economies? Yeah, Leah, I think it's uh, a really important part of the story, so thank you for, uh, for, for giving me a chance to say a few words about it. Uh, in Australia, we've seen uh, pretty strong and rising support for our humanitarian program, which to me is, uh, is, is uh, heartening. Uh, and I think uh, one of the striking moments in the debate was a couple of, uh, I, was it last year, when the front page of the Herald Sun editorialised, let them come, with reference to Syrian refugees. 
the, uh, there's certainly a roiling debate over the Refugee Resettlement Agreement, uh, but I think it's, it's unambiguous that without it, we couldn't have had strong, uh, strong public support for taking an additional 12,000 Syrian refugees. Uh, refugee flows in the world are uh, rising markedly uh, and countries are uh, increasingly struggling with uh, the approach that most advanced countries have taken, which is that you select your refugees not out of camps working with the UNHCR, but based on who arrives at your doorstep. Uh, that was an approach uh, uh, which was appropriate to flows of people across land in the wake of World War II, uh, but it's potentially a pretty dangerous approach uh, when you're dealing with people who are coming by, uh, by, by boat, uh, where the journey is far more hazardous and where, for example, if you look at the journey from Java to Christmas Island, uh, the probability of dying is about 1 in 20. Uh, so I do think Australia wants to do a number of things with refugees. We should take more refugees. We should treat those who we turn away as humanely as possible. We should welcome those as strong, who come as strongly as possible. Uh, and we should make sure that no one dies trying to get to Australia. Uh, and in Europe, they're increasingly moving towards, uh, towards that. Uh, the horrendous drownings that they've seen in the Mediterranean have led many European countries to reconsider the, the so-called Dublin Rule, uh, where the first country of, uh, of, of disembarkation is the place where you claim refugee status, and to think about whether Europe ought to now be working as the United States, Canada and Australia does with the UNHCR to select people out of camps rather than requiring to make these incredibly risky journeys. We have time for one or two more, and I saw some hands at the front. So I think we'll take you, sir, and then you as the last one. Uh, Des Hoban, I'm into habitat restoration in Brisbane, so I'm not sure I'm in the right uh, venue. Globalisation, yes, excellent openness in trade, unquestionable, and our Lloyd support there. The other two legs, though, we've just heard that uh, you need to be a bit more selective about migration. Europe is going to reap an awful legacy for its openness uh, in Germany. There's going to be a legacy of communal tensions there. In the area of investment, I think we shouldn't be uh, too naive either. What we've got is a situation, for instance, in Australia, 16% of agricultural land owned foreignly by China. We've had massive invasion of the IT economy into Australia. We're paying huge rents to the US. We've failed to protect our interests there. Our interlocutors aggressively and systematically and coherently push investment programs. China coherently pushes investment into Australia. Lots and lots of state support for that process. That's not happening by independent Chinese investors. That's a systematic program. So I think we need to be a bit uh, cute about openness in investment flows. Question is, what's the philosophical basis? Where, where are the parameters? Where is the guidance? Where do we draw the line? So Des, thank you for the, uh, for the two questions. I think on, on migration, we do want to make sure that we're recognising that uh, refugees aren't just mouths to feed, but they're also muscles and minds. Uh, and it would be remiss not to note that uh, among the great Australian refugees are uh, uh, not just Anne Doe and Les Murray, uh, but also Frank Lowy, who of course uh, founded the Institute without which we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, and for Germany, they will uh, build many of these refugees in their social fabric. A million is a, is a huge number, I totally agree with you. Uh, but immigrant assimil refugee assimilation is working much better in some of the, in some of the big cities, uh, and particularly in a labour market with a low unemployment rate. Uh, Germany's artificially low exchange rate has been a huge spur to the labour market. And it so happens that Germany is now in the position where it's reaped an unfair dividend from having a low exchange rate, 
and it's spending some of that dividend on taking a disproportionate share of Syrian refugees. In the kind of arc of human history, that doesn't strike me as a bad trade-off. Uh, but you, asked, you, you focused there on, on uh, foreign investment, and, and I, I totally agree that we've got to make sure we get the settings right around foreign investment. It's not just saying foarign investment is good because one dollar and nine of total investment is foreign investment. Uh, it's also about making sure that we don't have a hodgepodge of screening thresholds. I don't know why a Canadian investment of $300 million needs to be scrutinised, but not an American investment of $300 million. Uh, it's about getting a clear-headed debate around national security, uh, where the Ausgrid and the Port of Darwin debates have been hopelessly muddy uh, and conducted by reference to the single bid, which is embarrassing for the bidders and complicating for the rest of us, rather than talking about what are the principles? What are we trying to achieve? What are we worried about? Uh, and having a clear-eyed discussion about national security is, is really important. It's not as though the national security risks aren't there, uh, but we need, uh, and we're grown up enough to be told by the security boffins what they're worried about in broad terms uh, and how, how to tackle those. Uh, and we talked before about the, uh, uh, the tax question that, uh, that Shay raised too. Uh, unless we get that multinational tax piece right, it'll be hard to maintain the public support for foreign investment. Andrew, we're going to run very slightly over. Will you, will you indulge us for one more? I would love to take a last question. Let's yes. take this young lady's question. Yeah. Um, I'm Emma, just a globally uni university student. Um, my question was, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of Guy Standing. He no. created the idea of the precariat, which is a new class outside the traditional class system defined by their jobs at insecurity. Mm. So think along the lines of unpaid internships or the increasing casualization of the workforce. He, um, he claimed that the origin of this class came from globalization. And he also stated that people who are pushed into the precariat from traditional classes like the working class are more likely to vote for far right populist parties, while people who enter the workforce as part of the precariat aren't likely to engage in political um, discourse at all. So, if you, um, with your approach to openness in Australia, how would you protect people who are at risk of entering the precariat? So, Emma, it's, a, it's a great question. I hadn't heard of Guy, but I'd certainly heard of the term, the precariat. Uh, and while, if you look at the numbers on job duration, job duration's actually rising in Australia, uh, casualisation hasn't shown a significant upswing in recent years, there's reason to be worried that, uh, that, that, that that truck might be coming down the road. Uh, my uh, Queensland colleague Jim Chalmers has a new book out called Changing Jobs with Mike, Qu Mike Quigley, which I think really points to the fact that most of this is technology, not trade. Uh, you can see that if you just go back through the list of occupations uh, that no longer exist and the ones that have been created. Uh, over the last generation, we've killed occupations like public telephone money collectors and lighthouse keepers. Uh, we no longer have uh, lamp men. Uh, we no longer have newspaper boys as, uh, as a job title. Uh, and then we've created jobs like multimedia designers and bloggers and genetic engineers and uh, uh, a host of in-person work such as disability support officers. Uh, technology is underpinning most of that, uh, most of that change and technology is also driving this, this risk of the precariat that you've spoken about. Uh, the so-called sharing economy needs to not just work for uh, consumers, it needs to work for, for workers as well. And maybe that idea we spoke about before around having a third kind of employment contract uh, or around maintaining employment protections needs to be important. Uh, sharing economy apps are great, but they shouldn't compete by paying less tax. They shouldn't compete by providing and taking away opportunities to people with disabilities, uh, and they certainly shouldn't compete by failing to pay minimum wages. And the technology actually makes it easier to, uh, to, to monitor. Uh, we can know much more readily what an Uber driver is earning per hour than we know what a taxi driver is earning per hour. So it oughtn't be beyond our wit to update the institutions to make sure that we have jobs that are stable and strong enough that you can rely on them to raise a family and pay a mortgage. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings our event to a close. I'm very sorry we didn't get to all the questions. Um, if you can still, if the uh, salesperson is still out there, please do buy a copy of uh, Choosing Openness if you haven't already. Um, if you can't get it out there, visit the Lowy Institute website. You can buy a copy via uh, our website or just visit the website. There's lots of great reading <laughs> on there. <laughs> and um, with that, I would just ask you please to put your hands together for Andrew Lee. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'd ask... Um, me. I've jumped yes, the gun on you, Sam. Sorry. Professor Caitlin Byrne from <laughs> the Griffith Asia Institute. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sam and Andrew. Um, it's really a delight for Griffith Asia Institute to be working in partnership with Lowy Institute and hosting uh, Andrew and Sam in a conversation about choosing openness. Um, Andrew, I've heard you speak before. I know I mentioned that earlier. I've heard you on the radio. I've heard you speak in person at Parliament House. And I have to say, you are absolutely striking in your ability to cover such a breadth of issues <laughs> in such depth and to stay remarkably enthused and get us enthused about economics in particular. Um, I know there are some economists in the audience, um, so, you know, no, I apologise for that. But this depth of knowledge that you have um, in and, and in engaging us in a conversation is quite remarkable. Um, so thank you very much for that. Three points really struck me tonight, and I just wanted to very, very quickly touch on those. The first is really a point of style over substance. The idea of a politician engaging in long-form writing. <laughs> Somewhat unconventional, I would say, in this era of tweets and announceables. Um, really refreshing, too. So. Thank you for engaging in that process and I was delighted to hear that one of the other long form uh, pieces that the Lowy Institute has produced was written by one of my predecessor, uh, Russell Trude, who was the director of the Griffith Asia Institute previously and is, is very fondly remembered by us. So very nice to have his name brought up tonight as well. Um, secondly, the role of politics and I think it's so important to remind us that the role of politics and politicians is about making the big decisions for the benefit of our nation, not just now, but also for future generations. Um, and I think sometimes we, we, we don't see the best side of politics. Um, populism, of course, stands in the way. Um, and, and that can be an issue and there is that ebb and flow, a give and take, a retreat and, and advancement uh, in the way that our political parties work together and those moments of bipartisanship mm. seem to be what produces those, <coughs> big, those big ideas, bless you. Um, and so this is a framework that really is where good policy comes from and we need to get that framework back in place. So. Uh, that was my second theme. And the third was the significance of mobility. And this nation in particular has always prospered from the flow of goods and services, people but also ideas, um, and most especially when that flow relates to the way we sit in our region and how we connect to our region. A and you know, it's, it's very important that we resist the idea of complacency, I think someone raised that earlier, as well as the idea of arrogance, potentially that we can go it alone, that we engage personally, that we think about our literacy capabilities, our language capabilities. And not only do we accept and think about the investment that comes into our nation, but that we also invest in our region. And when it comes to this idea of the flow of ideas, I'd like to also thank, thank Sam. Um, Sam Rogovin, as founding editor of The Interpreter, you've done a brilliant job of widening the conversation, um, really engaging people in, in debate and thinking about some of those big issues. Uh, it's, it's a really worthwhile website and I would encourage all of you, if you haven't, if you don't log on to it, do log on to it. Um, because it, it is, in terms of getting to some of those big ideas, it's all about the conversation that we have. And so on that point, I'd like to thank you, the audience. We have a really remarkable spread of people, accountants and economics, people in design, language teachers, academics, um, 
students. It's really been fantastic to have that breadth of engagement, some really great questions. So what a, what a good discussion it's been. I'd like to thank you all. And I would also like to acknowledge the Consul General for Japan. It's really wonderful to have you here again tonight. Uh, and lastly, a very big thank you to the team that makes all of this happen, both from Lowy and from Griffith University, um, the people who usher us in and make sure we're well fed and looked after, the people that look after the wonderful ambient rain sounds, um, <laughs> but, but just the, the technical aspects, the video. Um, thanks very much for coming out tonight. A, a good night to you all, and I hope to see you at our next event. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Beautifully wraps up.